Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name's Claire Higgerty. I'm the chair of the Peckham Heritage Regeneration Partnership. Uh, it's really great to see loads of new faces here tonight, um, as well as some familiar faces. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words uh, to set the scene. Um, the Peckham Heritage Regeneration Partnership has been going since 2016, and it was built on, it was formed on work that had been done by the community uh, for many years before that. Um, so we're a, we're a partnership of people, of local people, um, represented us from local organisations, um, Southwark Council councillors and officers, and sort of generally, generally people who are motivated and passionate about co community involvement in their local environment and Peckham Town Centre and the history and distinctive character of this place. Um, so what does the Peckham Heritage Regeneration Partnership do? Well, we're, we sit within the kind of context of the bigger Townscape Heritage Initiative, which is um, funded by Southwark Council and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, and so we work uh, to support the delivery of the Townscape Heritage Initiative um, to support the, the Peckham, Riley and Peckham conservation area and to develop a sort of parallel, um, ever evolving program of community events and activities of which this is one. Um, so this talk is part of a, an ongoing series called Peckham Heritage Talks, which have been quite wide ranging um, and sort of responsive and kind of, again, ever evolving. So um, I'd like to just also particularly welcome um, two special guests here tonight, who are Pradyum and Jyoti Patel, who are the owners of number 102 Peckham High Street. Um, and so it's just a thank you for getting involved and thank you for coming tonight. So hopefully you might wanna add to the discussion later on when you when you feel like it, you're very welcome. Um, so I just wanted to just put you in the picture about the format. Um, I'm going to hand over in a few minutes to Julie Mallet, who's the Southwark, uh, who's the THI manager and a Southwark, Southwark Council officer. And Julie's just gonna say a few words to kind of add another layer of context. And then we're going to hand over to Felicity from um, Jan Katane Architects, who, who, and Felicity was the project ar architect for the THI projects. Um, Felicity will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we, we're gonna have another 45 minutes of questions and answers. Um, what we thought we'd do is invite you as the as the talk proceeds to put questions and comments in the chat room. Uh, Julie and I will be keeping a close eye on the chat. And then when the actual question and answer session starts, you can raise your hand, um, your blue hand uh, to ask a question. So hopefully people can, um, there'll be room for all the questions which you, and comments, which you definitely will have, I'm sure. Um, we're, Going to get into, we're going to send a follow up email after after tonight, just to invite you to join our our mailing list so that you can be informed about future events and um, updated on our news. So look out for that. And we thought that the kind of best format tonight would be to have the cameras on if you've got a camera, but the sound off, um, just to kind of keep the flow of things. So. That's the general rule. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm just going to hand over now to Julie. Should we, we say, intervene? Should we just intervene and say about recording? <clears throat> oh, yes. 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 Thank you, Eileen. This is being this um, talk is being recorded. And the plan is that we have it on then posted on our website because it's a sort of marvelous resource for other people to um to look at. If you've got any issues with this, let us know. Um, well, I guess people need to put themselves on 
uh, you know, to turn their video off, really, if you're yeah. not happy um, with that. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that's yeah. it. So I'll hand over to you now, Julie. Yes, thanks very much, um, Claire. So um, yes, welcome everybody. It's lovely to see every you know people. So many people coming to hear on hear this update. Um, so as Claire said, I'm the project manager for the Peckham Townscape Heritage Initiative, and I'm just going to say a few more things to put the talk in context. Um, it's taken ten years to get um, from the idea of the Peckham THI to where we are now. Um, with nine buildings completed. Um, some people in the Zoom, um, including Eileen Kahn and Benny O'Looney and others from Peckham Vision and the Peckham Society, had the initial idea to see if the National Lottery Heritage Fund would um, consider Peck an area like Peckham as a potential recipient of THI funding. And at that point, it was quite unusual for, I don't think there'd been any London schemes for urban schemes to be considered. So um, they issued an invitation to the Heritage Fund to do a walkabout in the uh, town centre to see the fabulous eclectic array of um, architectural styles and the buildings that needed some care and attention. And um, obviously um, authorization to make the application was given. Um, and then local people, including the ones I've, I've mentioned and the Peckham Society and Peckham Vision and, and, and others and Southwark Council officers, um, particularly Michael Sukaris, who is the head of uh, design and conservation um, in the planning department at Southwark Council and his team worked in partnership. So local people and um, council officers working in partnership to um, submit the applications two stages um, to the Heritage Fund. And, and that took, I mean, uh, around, you know, more than a year, 18 months or so to do that. Um, and in addition, um, Whilst that was happening, the council worked to, through the stages of designating the Rye Lane Peckham conservation area, because without that designation, that, that designation of the conservation area, the funding wouldn't finally have been awarded. Um, so that all that work then took us up to 2015 when I was appointed to actually deliver the programme, the, the project. Um, so 44 buildings had been authorised as eligible for funding. And the target uh, for completion is, is 12. Um, uh, and there are many stages of um, work that needed to be done in order to, before any work can start on site or any funding um, agreed. Um, lots of work to contact the freeholders and leaseholders of the 44. <clears throat> um, um, and it's not as easy as that as it sounds as quite a number of the buildings are owned by well have complex ownership structures are owned by companies registered overseas and a number a proportion a significant proportion of the freeholders and leaseholders just were not interested at all. Um, lots of work to explain how the project would work. Um, it's quite an unusual prospect, isn't it? You know, the council approaching a freeholder or leaseholder saying we want to do some work on your building and quite a lot of the money, quite a lot of the work is going to be paid for. So lots of work explaining that. Lots of work to draft the designs that meet both the commercial needs and the retailer and the, uh, of, as well as uh, meet the conservation standards of the Heritage Fund. Um, working through legal and funding agreements, securing planning permission, issuing tender documents and appointing a contractor and at every stage liaising with the Heritage Fund to ensure compliance with the, with the requirements of, this, of the program. Um, funding for works can only be made, this is important, if um, freeholders and or retailers agree to contribute financially to the works. And sometimes um, discussions and negotiations have gone quite far along and then um, for one reason or another, freeholders and leaseholders have decided not to participate, sometimes about financially, sometimes about the legal requirements that, um, but it, so that's been something that's happened uh, quite a number of times. Um, and as Claire said, um, we're lucky today that one freeholder who's participated is on this Zoom or, a, you know, a couple, um, Jyoti and Pradnium. And we wouldn't have been here today without, you know, the cooperation of you and, others um, and the trust that you've put in um, to the you know to the council and to the architects to make the 
to actually participate in the scheme. So a really big thank you from me for, to, for that. Um, so construction works to the first three properties, phase one began in July, 2018. Um, and once that work, and then once that work started, then a whole nother series of kind of engagement with uh, more freeholders and leaseholders to secure participation in phase three um, started and phase, sorry, phase two, sorry. And phase two started um, at the end of 2019 and we're just about finishing that phase. Um, the ethos of the THI works is that um, the repair and restoration work um, must be carried out respecting the historic fabric and the architectural detailing, and that as far as possible, legislative and regulatory frameworks allow, and sorry, and um, as far as possible that uh, traditional materials and traditional methods are used to do the works. Um, and that's not generally what happens with town centre retail units. So it's a quite, um, it's a big departure from what often takes place in town centre, urban town centres. Um, this specialist approach um, requires uh, great attention to detail um, from all involved, the architect, the main contractor and uh, specialist providers. And um, this is the work that Felicity is going to be talking, uh, talking to us about now. And um, as you'll hear, there are, each building has its own story, and I do hope that you um, enjoy what you're about to, or, you know, take, you know, find it really interesting what's coming up next. So over to you, Felicity. Great, okay, thank you very much. Um, I've just shared my screen. I've prepared some visual content, because um, there's lots of it. Um, let me just make sure that's all working. So can you see that? Yes. Is that visible? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. great. Um, okay, great. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening to hear about the works um, that have been ongoing as part of the THI. Um, um, I'd just like to thank Julie and Claire for giving me this opportunity. I'm really looking forward to the journey that will go on tonight um, and the discussion at the end. Oh, just wondering, I can't move my next. Oh. Hmm. I'll just stop sharing and reshare. I've got a technical glitch here. No. Okay, I might not be able to go full screen. Um, or maybe if I try it this way. Okay, we're on track, I think. So um, just to begin with, I'd like to give you a small rundown of what I'll be covering this evening. Might cross over a little bit with Julie, but for many of you may not have heard about the company I work for, Yankton Architects. Um, so just a little bit about us, that we're a small studio in North London um, that have built a portfolio um, of inventive projects, which always make the opportunity of a unique, um, particular challenging site context to to bring on some bring on projects um, uh, for the future. Um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about the area. It's easy to forget how far we've come in this scheme. As Julie's mentioned, it goes back to sort of uh, 10 years. Um, and finally, I will look to give a bit of an overview of the phases, which before I go into a further breakdown of each building to sort of discuss the detail, the craftsmanship, the materials and the translation from drawings to built form. So a little bit more about JKA. We are one of the UK's foremost experts in high street regeneration. Between 2010 and 2020, we've completed works to over 400 businesses and about five kilometers worth of high streets. Um, this can vary from preparing regeneration strategies um, to, uh, to revisiting, revisiting conservation areas um, and further um, working on the rest restoration of Victorian buildings. For example, this is a project we did in High, uh, high, Lake, high Road Lake, um, which shows you the dramatic change that uh, occurred uh, after, uh, before and after the works. 
So uh, uh, many of you know Peckham really well, um, but uh, I think it's it, 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 it's uh, worth reminding ourselves uh, of the actual context we're working in. So JK were appointed in 2016 to uh, deliver the t uh, the to deliver the works that Julie was uh, brought on board to deliver. So we had to look at the ambition of the project, which was to really look at spending this money across the project, across the buildings in the area that were really in need of these repairs and restorations so that the whole uh, high street could become uh, uh, returned to its former glory and help stitch together um, the, the high street environment as a whole. So we immediately started working with Southwark Council to address the, the conversations that really needed to be had, as Julie mentioned, with leaseholders and freeholders on a very a fine grain approach. Um, this helped really um, help freeholders and leaseholders understand the works, um, which can, as, as a result, as many of you can see, prior to these works hadn't been done for numerous of reasons, but sometimes it's because it's quite daunting to take on maintenance of historic buildings. Um, so the 44 buildings did fall within the Peck and Rye Lane conservation area. So there was a, a strategy that was put forward to look at properties that were in a high priority, a medium priority and a reserved priority. Um, as Julie mentioned, we talked to a lot of the, uh, we, we almost pretty much talked to all 44 of these buildings, if not more. Um, and this really helped us study the ecosystem of the environment and really get to grips with uh, the dynamic conversations happening between neighbouring buildings um, and alike. So uh, to begin with, we, we initiated a phase one where we looked at um, developing and investigating uh, um, the works to three buildings. So this was two 18th century former public houses and an 1830s terraced house. So during the works, uh, several historic artifacts and underlying conditions were discovered. Um, but with our team, we managed to either able to restore these features, replicate them identically, or revise details using appropriate conservation techniques. At the beginning, we had to go through a dynamic consultation process with uh, many design, um, design uh, um, officers, conservation officers, as well as conservation consultants, which we um, had brought onto the team from Ecos McLean, uh, um, um, a fellow called John Hutchinson. And he really helped us use a comprehensive audit of historic building material to look back to assess um, the English heritage area assessment, um, any cartographic evidence, contemporary photographs and any surviving fabric details which we could use. Then as a result with this palette of materials and resources, we were confident that we could conserve and use sustainable methods to restore features which would be able to be maintained over the next course of 100 years. Um, there was then finally a following extension to the, uh, the number of buildings we undertook. There were five more properties um, and this ranged from an 1800s cottage, three more 1830s terrace buildings and another 18th century public uh, house. So alongside further repairs, the phase two saw the THI design team um, look to establish how to support existing street businesses that were already trading. So this arranged from including signage, which balanced heritage fascia concerns with a nighttime economy, integrating much needed ventilation using cast iron grills in shop front um, uh, pediments. And on the whole, um, and, and, uh, and range again from display stands and hand painted traditional hanging signs so that you can attract attention from further away down the street. Um, on the whole, a uh, uh, principle that's been enshrined in the Society for Protecting Ancient Buildings states that uh, over uh, changes that occur to a building um, over time is ought to be respected and not casually disregarded during later renovations. So this is something that we, we look to hold on to and apply to on a building by, 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 building by building case. But the main works were really to look at repairs and restoration of the appearance of the buildings as a whole um, and looking at where damaged or lost historical features were 
um, and balancing them with these with retail adaptations and patch repairs that had been done. So this brings me on to a first building to look at in more detail, uh, 119 Peckham High Street. Um, it, many of you might know this as it's a very impressive building. Um, it's a converted public house, formerly known as the Old Crown Hotel. As noted in the area assessment by English Heritage, there was a building on this site in 1830s, but in 1891, this public house was rebuilt to some later designs. But when we get to the sort of 21st century, the public house, which was converted by this point into shop units, and in fact, two, one in the main, uh, um, main central area of the space and one to the side, but they had retained the marble pilasters, Corinthian columns, the flanking entrance with, um, with three floors of flats and an extension by this point onto the fourth floor. But a lot of the various um, adaptations onto the facade have started to clutter and disrepair um, the overall appearance. As a result, using that principle I've just discussed, we looked at how to, to, to uncover the, uh, the ornamented upper facades to really reassert the building's presence on the main street. The condition we found, the modillion upper cornice and the elaborated parapet balustrade was visibly incomplete. You could see even from street level when I show you here, that the, uh, it was incomplete and some methods to quick fix the corner was considerably altering the appearance. So by removing these interventions and repairing or replacing urns in full and the, and the bottle, uh, bottle baluster to the corner, we managed to really re-establish the grandeur nature of this part of the building whilst respecting the rooftop extension. So this, it may, uh, this is one of my favorite things to look at is before and after. Um, it really starts to show you how the uh, window surrounds and the building um, actual features of this building were extremely impressive, um, but just the slow um, condition of them being affected by defect flashings and several layers of paint really um, uh, had created several defects. Um, so when we were looking at the, the um, or origin of the facade, we had to do a lot of work to strip back the paint and the defect, defect, um, defective fabric that had blown out over the course to make sure it was weather tight and that the new work that we were doing to the facade would um, have a longevity to it. Um, and uh, yes, when we were stripping it back, we could see quite a lot of old colors of paint that would have been potentially in different areas of the, um, of the details. But by 19, 1905, we saw that it was only one color and therefore kept it this way. Some smaller details was a reinstatement of a gate at the corner elevation. Um, it was, uh, as you saw previously, there was this ad hoc shutter. So there was these concerns of security. Um, and in this way, um, we didn't. Um, we wanted to make sure that a new gate would provide this. But um, since we didn't have any more um, information, historical information on a previous gate that um, could have existed here, we looked to make the gate um, unobtrusive and curved to suit. Um, so one of the highlights of this building was the um, discovery of a um, unseen piece of history, which was a stained glass to the corner, um, so the side return of the shop front. We had proposed to put a, a new shop front in this location. However, uncovering this, we discovered that there was a um, stained glass shop front in fill panels still remaining. Unfortunately, the condition was extremely poor. They had already been touched up and um, patch repaired. So the, the subcontractor recommended we used it to replicate new um, stained glass and the wording was copied across um, to um, ensure um, fair replication. And this was quite an exciting day on site. Lots of public were really fond of seeing this moment. Um, maybe it was a sunny day as well. Um, but by the end, it was really great to see that uh, the that the um, finished works had really started to, um, to bring this building back to being something everyone was proud to remember. 
So following on, we have 116 Peckham High Street, also known as the Red Bull. Um, maybe a lot of you know it as well. Um, we had lots of people coming up on site uh, telling us stories about the Red Bull. Um, it's again a public, former public house, which sits here in this cluster on the opposite side of the road to 119 Peckham High Street. So they almost acted like gateways into Peckham. Um, so we know again also from the English heritage that a, a pub um, used to exist here and went by the name the Red Bull. Um, however, it was likely that this building was rebuilt when they widened the road in the 1880s. Um, and uh, um, there was a short, uh, there was a rear yard to the back of it. Um, another really nice piece of history in this building is the, uh, which is still there today, is this um, uh, tiled panel um, uh, adorning the inside uh, wall on the ground floor, which depicts the trial of Queen Catherine um, and was done by W.B. Simpson and Son. So we had to look at bringing this, uh, um, this, this building was going to be brought back into use as a public, um, public house or restaurant, uh, restaurant use. So we looked at trying to make the ground floor as, um, as consensive as one, as one unit um, and in keeping with its original features. Um, we had to do some investigative works to establish if this was a, a true opening, an original opening to the side elevation. And so uncovering the, uh, the brickwork, we were able to conclude that uh, this was an original opening, um, um, but the way the, the, um, the window inside potentially was not. So to try to help the retailers use the space better, we produced a, um, um, a new bifolding window um, in the same same with the same dimension, same details as the front uh, elevation to keep it um, in keeping. And we painted the most things red to keep in with the building's name. Um, the upper story brickwork for this property was really carefully repaired as found. Um, it's, um, we had to do a careful cleaning technique. Some of you might or know a lot about cleaning brick techniques, um, but I'll just explain it for those who don't. So it's, we used a DOF cleaning method. Um, this is a specialist cleaning process, which uses superheated water to produce high pressured steam. Um, this is quite a delicate procedure. Um, it really only tries to remove the soot and the pollution that's on the exterior of the brick rather than being abrasive. Um, once this was complete, the brickwork was dried and excess dust and dirt was brushed off and some samples of different lime mortar mixes were reviewed before we did a, re a full repointing of the brickwork. Um, so a lot of as, um, the idea for this repointing is that it, it is a long a long term um, intervention which helps to secure the brickwork and the facade of the building. So we made sure that we were using an appropriate mix um, to ensure this longevity. Other items to restore um, or additions and alterations to the facade were to look at sort of the areas which um, uh, you know, if they weren't replaced or if they weren't um, um, restored, they would look to the general public or to the high street context as neglected or impoverished. So, for example, we had an element of the brattishing above the ground floor cornice, um, the metal work. It was missing, so we looked to replicate this, in, um, at, at, and also we looked to replicate the um, modulin section of the cornice at the um, the top parapet and this was easily done using squeeze molds used with um, traditional methods um so great it, it had a, such a huge impact some of these very small parts but as a as a whole they really started to come together so to really to make sure that the building read as a whole and really um would um allow the architectural features to sing sort of the color palette was kept uh, very um stripped back to really consider um, uh, the original uh, materiality. So uh, the granite, um, Balmoral granite, which um, was reused in the section to the left-hand side of the front, um, was sort of allowed to keep that color of the, the red on the ground floor and the more natural um, stone materials to the others. 
a very small detail. Um, it's not bigger than your hand as a single unit is this tile that compromise com uh, complements the tile freeze to the lower level. It's almost sort of like a frosting around the, the cake. Um, so there was a huge portion of it which was missing. It was heavily damaged to the above the door front and there was a huge part missing to the side elevation. So uh, taking, a, taking one of these tiles carefully down, we were able to send it to a subcontractor um, called Craven Dunhill. And they mocked up these samples, so, um, which was, and we were then able to do some tests with colours. After a couple of close matches with the colouring, we we did decide to leave the new tiles slightly lighter because they will get dirty and age, and they will delve down um, and and settle in with the existing. So another small piece of the puzzle, but the stakeholders were really pleased to see the building's fabric um, come back to life in this way. So the last property of the phase one is a um, is a terrace building. As I mentioned, it sits within the so-called uh, Shard Terrace. So this is the name given to the land ownership of this part of the road, and it was built as part of a wide a wide area transformation in the mid 18th century. Um, again, the assessment of Peckham done by the English Heritage um, made it um, made us aware of the history of this of this curve, which reflected the early developments of the, of the uh, widening of the road, of the changes to transportation. Um, however, it was noted that the houses at this point would have originally had a small garden in the front. So the pavement actually is quite wide at this point, which is very interesting. Um, but at the time we've you know, got to it, there had been a lot of um, changes to it being a residential home. Um, with the uh, shop on the ground floor, um, but also about uh, there was um, a parapet which had been removed by the 1970s, um, which had exposed a lot of the rooftop to some freeze thaw cycles. Um, and again, the shop front alteration was a little bit unsympathetic um, with uh, the building that it was hosted, um, and it sort of contributed to this overall poor condition. Um, and a very bright, bright nighttime advertisement. So as I mentioned, the part of the repairs and restoration that were put forward for this building was to really improve the condition um, of the, uh, to, so it would be in line with the appearance of its neighboring properties. So we reinstated the lost parapet. Um, this really helped to, um, it, to clarity, give clarity to the Shard Terrace. Um, and we also looked to, to strip back the roof, which really had no adverse or restricting effects to the building as a whole, but it really helped the stakeholders to maintain and invest the historic fabric for the future. Um, so natural materials were used up here on the uh, roof top. Um, moving on, we have the front elevation, which is sort of, as you can see here from this before and after, really had quite a dramatic effect. So the facade that we had to look at and investigate um, had had at least two coats of cement mortar um, applied to it during this 20th century. So this additional cement render, which um, after stripping back, we observed had really uh, denied the conservation effort to practically restore the bonded um, brickwork. The brick faces were um, damaged because there had been a, mechan a mechanical bond between the render and the brick surfaces. So to ensure, um, to ensure um, a new um, breathable surface, we used a lime render. Um, this is a, um, a, a um, a durable and highly resilient um, uh, potassium silicate based render, which allows the brickwork to breathe naturally. <clears throat> Again, we looked at installing two, some, some new windows. Um, the previous windows, as you can see on the left, were UVPC um, um, uh, completely um, disconnected with the building, the host building. So the new um, double hung slide sash windows were fabricated to fit very carefully into the existing reveals, allowing for the box sash to be set back. Um, the materials we used really complemented the, um, the new 
the new designs, we had to use a slim light glass, which ensured the safety to achieve the, gla the glazing glass, and it also achieved the thermal insulation. Um, so we really get to see that a lot of these smaller details in the shop front um, have really sort of helped being returned to using a timber materiality. They're extremely easy to maintain by local craftsmanship, but they still manage to obtain a branding of the existing business and an illumination at night. So it was really nice to hear when the stakeholder, a couple of um, leaseholders changed in this property, but um, during the process, uh, the leaseholder was very happy with the um, shop front that was put in. So that's the conclusion of phase one. Um, so I'll move on to phase two. Um, so the first property in phase two um, is a late Victorian red build it, brick building. Um, it's seen here on the right hand side of this historical photo. Um, just um, so it's a two story um, uh, over a ground floor shop front with a slate man hung mansard attic roof. Um, again, we noted, noted from the assessment of the area that this uh, side of the street, the south side of the high street, was extremely um, eclectic uh, um, and vernacular in its, and it retained a lot of the earlier development of the area. Um, so this was quite exciting. Um, and as a result, when we look back at, we looked at it um, at the current time, we could see that a lot of uh, um, changes that had happened to it are starting to sort of clutter and disrepair the impressiveness of this building and reduce the splendor of many of its uh, original historical design features. So as I hear, sorry, just show here, this ranged from the grand um, granite pilasters. They had been drilled in with defunct fixings, attracting further graffiti and stickers and signs. Um, the Portland stone um, console brackets were partially broken and fractured due to a uh, doubled up projecting roof, um, which was an ad hoc attempt to waterproof the shop front. The brickwork as a whole was very, um, uh, very beautiful, a lot of detail, but soot and the sills were, had been decorated to make them appear more clunky than they really were. Um, the bands, the recognizable stone bands you can see are, um, were in need of some, some cleaning repairs. But finally, uh, again, the sash windows had been replaced with these inappropriate PVC um, so uh, uh, that, uh, that really helped us gather the information to put forward a scope where we did a lot of works to ensure a, um, some tests were done to see what was the most appropriate cleaning method. As I mentioned, there's a very delicate, this was very delicate because of the Flemish bond and the bordering features that had a cut and rub molding borders in around the windows, which um, really uh, a lot of soot and um, uh, dirt was getting uh, caught in. So we did um, agree that the most appropriate um, cleaning method was to use the DOF cleaning, um, again, because we could do it at a, a lower pressure to make sure we were not removing any of the delicacy of the mortar. Um, so um, further down, there was the stone bands, and oh, just forgot that, the, the stone bands on the left-hand side, where some, again, some really close attention to um, the corners allowed us to really clean those up. Um, where necessary, things were really done by hand. Um, and further down, when we had elements that were really missing, we used a crack stitch method, um, to, um, which was invisible once installed, so it doesn't disrupt the aesthetics of the feature. Um, we did leave this, um, we did clean this up more, and we did uh, leave it unpainted because we've left all of the Portland stone on this building unpainted to show off its natural Color. Um, again, I think, uh, the, oh, did I go past that? No. So, uh, oh, I'll just go to that quickly. So, you see uh, how quickly some of those very simple cleaning and repair to restore some of those historical features really allow the building to breathe. Um, so, I'll just go back. 
So uh, some really interesting pieces that you don't sort of see um, uh, is the when we did remove the existing sign box, we revealed a historical wood and shutter behind it. Um, on review of its position, it was concluded that it was um, not to be removed. It was it, it probably provided compressional strength between the two party walls for some time. So removing it could cause some further works to, and disruption to the area. Um, but at, at, and at this point, the shop front had been pushed forward. So this was actually, uh, this was further into the shop. Um, so this, um, this also started to elude the question about how to um, rework the basement. So we needed to look at replacing a rusted steel plate which had covered this gap between the uh, pavement and the shop front. Um, and we installed a new steel beam with a luxcrete light paving to allow light down into the basement. Um, so these are just some of those finer details I mentioned about the hanging sign, um, together with a new residential door and a dividing pilaster, you really start to see the composition of the building as a whole and its unique character. Um, so next door um, to this building is number 88. It's uh, quite different to its neighbor. It's a two-story um, late um, Georgian, which is evident from rear ele ele elevation brickworks, but from the front, it looks like it was rebuilt. Um, but in 1910, because there are some brick there are some red brick, oh, brick bands and gauged lintels um, over the windows. And again, this, um, this ties in with a internal rear meeting hall, which um, as you can see from this picture, there's actually a, um, an original um, hanging sign, which in this picture says hot red shop. So there was probably a lot more of a factory space here in this building at one point or bakery at one point. Um, but there were a lot of surviving features about this building, um, but the brickwork, which uh, has been re uh, attempted to be repaired several times in the past, there was lots of alternative fixings and uh, infill cement patches, um, which was really sort of um, discrediting the nature of the brickwork. And really, we had to look at stabilizing it to make sure that um, it it safeguarded for the future. So a lot of the works initiated with a, a brick survey, really taking out bricks which were beyond repair and um, any cement, uh, some temporary cement infills. Um, the patris plate and, um, was not disturbed. Um, so you can see quite quickly here again, some of those, uh, those, um, those elements coming together in the upper facade alongside additional sash windows. Um, let's move back. Um, so, so, um, so that brings us to the, um, did I go past it? No, I didn't. Um, the existing pilaster had, so they were actually still there. So we used to conserve these using timber resin, care resin, and this allowed us to redecorate them and in um, and, and, and re, um, reinstate a projecting shop front to allow for an awning, an, an electric operating awning. Um, there was a lot of, of, of layers of ad hoc um, awnings. I think we found something like three awnings um, in in the back of this building. Not not or not Victoria, but um, uh, later. Um, so it was really great to finally see this building, uh, um, some of the smaller elements to the shop front. Um, the, uh, we, it was one of the concerns of the stakeholder to have security, which we had looked to move in inside um, and allow for um, illumination at the same time. Um, again, there were some finer graphics that were done which really helped bring the business, um, a unique business to the high street. 
So 102 um, is, is just down the road from these buildings, but it's quite different. It's a cottage that sits next to similar buildings, um, which are of uh, a, a two storey, a rental shop front on the ground floor with a pitch late roof above. Now, the position of this little terrace um, is very much the centre of the old settlement of Peckham. Um, if, if it's of something of interest, you can see it back in dates, ma um, uh, back in maps dating to 1746. Um, and really, when you approach Peckham uh, from Peckham Hill Street, these are the, the three buildings that you see. Um, in 2008, we looked at uh, what proposal works we should do to this property. So we looked back at a lot of the surviving historical photographs and you can see here in 1945, we gathered some explanation for the loss of the original distinctive features um, because there, it, it was almost certain at this time there was some war, um, wartime bomb blast damage and a subsequent shop front had been installed. Um, the photograph also shows that the shop was incorporated into the retail area of the uh, um, adjacent properties um, and uh, then amalgamated into one unit. So uh, uh, later on when they reclaimed um, relinquished this uh, one retail unit, um, there was not much effort or um, to restore the decorative features to the original shop front um, uh, and a more modern adaptation was made. So to keep the uh, recent condition um, being entirely functional as well as uh, um, referring to a his, this historical merit, we look to readjust the ease level where their surface water drainage from the roof um, had been uh, altered. Uh, we reinstated the dormer um, in the pitch roof and re-replicated the timber pilaster heads, which were moulds taken off number 188 uh, Peckham High Street. And so those, some of those small moves alongside redecoration of the um, cement render um, gave an overhaul of, of, the, of the building um, as well as, um, and I'm sure um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Patel will say this as well, that uh, we re really looked at the, the drainage system um, because this property takes drainage from quite a few properties in the area. Um, so a little bit more detail on uh, some of the opening up works, um, discovering the condition, being able to um, uh, um, make the right um, structural modifications. Um, these are some details of the replica mouldings of the um, timber pilaster heads and the cast iron um, uh, vents and helmet. So it, um, again, looking back at the conservation principle, um, these items had been lost, but um, we did have a lot of evidence to make sure we informed the correct detailing. We looked at pattern books and we found catalogues of contemporary manufacturers who were making uh, these products now available very close to the appearance of what had been lost. Um, they're not exact copies for anyone who, who looks through the fine tooth comb, but they were near of with the panel dimensions and the way we set them out was very close to the original. Um, this is a bit of a uh, detail about the uh, sash windows. So this facade um, had has been altered um, um, severely, and we kind of, we looked at consul, uh, conserving it as found. So the new sash windows were proposed to be uh, usable, operable, but also keep in keeping with the the building's features as a whole. Um, it, it did go through a lot of deliberation and everybody was on board. Once we discussed quite a few different types of window options, um, this gave rise to um, this two over two and three over three in the larger middle window. So on a whole, the, um, the, the, there is a bit of asymmetry in the arrangement of the shop floor, but this is due to the modification of of uh, access to a residential, which hadn't previously been there. Um, but, and still we kept the tile stall riser um, as a um, difference to the original shop front um, and easeable of cleaning. So uh, heading to a property um, 
um, again in the same vicinity on the other side of the road and it, it kind of complements the, the first two public houses we did so this is the, the third public house it's called the Greyhound um, at 109 Peckham High Street um, it's it wasn't initially identified as a priority project, yet the, whilst we were on site doing phase one and phase two, the freeholder was undertaking several alterations to the building themselves. And as a result, it seemed an important time to also address and support the owner to review and upgrade the historical composition um, of this very wide spanning corner elevation. And so like many pubs, uh, you know, over time, the different management teams and different supply advertisement schemes and nighttime illumination changes, there had been lots of clutter to the facade with number of defunct fixings um, that had been left and scattered around. And once we remove signboards, we're seeing further um, conditions underneath. So um, the brickwork as a whole was you know, moderate condition, the stonework again, but um, once, uh, you know, it's a lot of these finer details we were only really seen on close um, inspection. So uh, this detailed survey, you know, established the principle of what would be repaired, restored and replaced, and how much repointing was essential. Um, the, um, um, the, the, what was a really nice comment was from one of the uh, masons on the, on, on the contractor's team, which said, you know, it's a good restoration and repair when at the end you step back, you look up at the brickwork and it looks like we haven't done anything to it at all, um, which I think, you know, it's, it, it, it made me laugh um, because it's true. <laughs> um, so kind of smaller in-depth investigations we saw it, we saw some of the pilasters um, were falling away from the backing. So we were to up, open these up to investigate um, some, any underlying conditions. Luckily, it was just uh, um, the plaster and, and cement that had blown out. And so by repairing this, we were able to um, move back. We were able to put back new tiles and um, to this area and the fascia above. Um, Again, we looked at removing all the old paint, which over years and years of being changed colours, as you can see here, it was red at one point, um, really start to lose the detail because you, you get this stepped lagging effect on any of the um, on any of the detail after you apply more and more coats of paint. So stripping everything back, and uh, which is a process in itself, uh, leaving um, an application on to allow softening of the um, pet previous paint layers and then stripping it off before applying any window resin care and um, uh, filling in, uh, removing of screws from the tile work to be able to fill in with Delft resins to coloured match. Um, a, a small sort of detail here, um, it was something we had an ambition to do, which was to strip back the tile work because um, it's of such a, a, a beautiful appearance as a whole. Um, the, it had, we started to realise why it had been covered up before. It was not in a, as good a condition as we had hoped. So um, looking at how to, to find a, um, a, an appropriate repair where we knew in due course over time this area was going to always be as a result of being so close to the ground level you know and people uh, if, um, standing here again and, and, and being bashed into again we looked at what would be the most um, um, a sympathetic improvement so by rebuilt, rebuilding the molding features to make sure that any missing pieces especially around the pilaster bases were built out to match the details of the tile work um, we then looked to um, close to match the paint painting of the tiles um, which can be easily maintained in the future um, on success of our our stained glass work in phase one we we used the same company again um, to undertake the stained glass fan um, uh, lights here which had been had lots of um, ad hoc adaptations with cut vents in and pieces missing so these were take, carefully removed and taken away from site um, and repaired and brought back and they looked as good as new 
Um, and this brings me on to the last property to discuss tonight, which is 105 Peckham High Street. It's a building I know most people have either had Elan Pie Mash there or know of another um, another outlet that serves Elan Pie Mash. Um, it's a building which we had this great um, record of, evidence of, and it is also in a very, it was in a good condition. But again, uh, we started to just sort of fine tooth kind of this, uh, what elements here could really do with some repairs and restoration to bring this building back to some former glory. And this uh, ranged from looking at the brickwork again, uh, the windows, uh, these were, um, uh, were not original windows, but were surviving details of uh, the three pane over three pane. And uh, we had the tile work, which again was uh, a beautiful glazing, uh, a marble pill, a marble stool riser, um, and um, a, an awning um, at the front. So um, this is a nice before and after because you know at, at, on the left hand side you would think oh well it, it's okay, um, but when you when you really start to see that element of picking apart those small um, those small scopes of work we really got to bring the building um, out further so uh, you know um, again this was a property that was brought on whilst we were on site so it was very much working with the contractor to do a survey a deep analysis of the existing brickwork condition and making sure we were being extremely thorough with the repairs um, um, a small bit, it's difficult to explain this one, but we, because we looked behind the, the sign of uh, the, the, the sign that we all see on the front elevation behind this awning um, is, uh, it, it notably looks like the, uh, the, this one here. So there, we were quite curious when we found a older sign even further behind this, it was quite unattainable um, to get any closer to it, um, uh, but you could see it was a hand-painted Victorian sign. Um, some some additional similar scenario to the building in phase 130, the roof um, was in a very poor condition, so something that you can see from this angle is uh, the new slate, Welsh slate, um, the tiles to the, the pitch roof. Um, so some of you might have seen um, very um, so carefully, we looked at readdressing that iconic signage on the brickwork. Um, it was something that the freeholder was key, very keen to do, to look at a, a new, a, a more appropriate um, style of um, signage um, and in keeping with the building. Um, and so this sort of very simple drop shadow effect uh, allowed for that and was hand painted. Again, those sash windows um, really make such a difference. You really start to see how they were carefully from the inside. There was also some architraves um, introduced inside um, and uh, um, uh, prime coats. And that was actually two, there was, it was painted by hand on the outside to be green and uh, maintained white on the inside. Um, some again, even smaller details. These tiles are even smaller than ones in 116. Is uh, the uh, uh, pilaster faces had this um, checker-like um, infill tile. In some cases, it was missing, so we looked to replace that. As well as the uh, below the capital, um, the pilaster heads. There was a capital, which in both sides was damaged and needed repair. So that brings me to a close on sort of those smaller detailed stories about the building. I'm very happy to take any questions um, if you have any and, and any discussions about uh, the, where the projects have, are got to now. Thanks, that's great. Thank you very much, Felicity. Um, let's see, does anyone you want to raise your hand if you've got any questions at the moment? Um, 
There's one from Clyde, Claire. Oh, sorry, Clyde. Can't see you there. Sorry, Clyde. Would you like to... Off you go, Clyde. Hmm. Right. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Okay. okay. Um, it, it's a general question that you, you are concerned primarily with the facades of these properties. Do you consider their use and uh, their environmental um, characteristics to the rear or roofs? And what do you do? What is your approach to uh, bringing them up to 21st, supposedly 21st century values when it comes to uh, energy and heat losses? Yes, that's a good question. So we did look at, I think, um, trying to do those repairs to roofs, for example, are one of the um, ways we looked at addressing the building, not just as a facade. Uh, there's no point in making the facade beautiful if the ceiling is going to drop in. But also, as you say, the thermal element of those roofs, a lot of them didn't have the uh, insulation that would be required by building control. So that's something we address. Again, with the glazing, that's something that we addressed to, to make sure we were upgrading thermal elements. I mean, we sorry, can I just uh, add something to that? I suppose we should be clear that the terms of the THI funding scheme was about repairs to the, the building envelope. Um, so the sort of scope of the project was limited at the outset. That that's how this kind of project is set up. Yes. Yeah. Um, Eileen, was there oh Eileen question and then Cleo? Eileen, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I was saying I was after Cleo and Clyde could remove his blue hand. Oh. Okay, shall I go ahead then? Thank you, Eileen. Um, Felicity, can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah, thank you very much for that um, comprehensive update. Um, it was fascinating. It was really interesting to sort of see the finer detail because obviously um, Judy's been, um, you know, has kept us up to date um, as, as the works progress. But I was, um, I've, I, I've got sort of two, two questions um, really. Um, the first is, um, how much work has been done in encouraging the freeholders to um, uh, maintain the, the, the works that's been done and, and in keeping with the conservation? Um, and, and have you managed to sort of educate them and, and actually be re retaining that sympathetic, um, those sympathetic features to um, the, the historical context? And also, um, I'm just, uh, I was curious to find out, or I'm curious to find out a little bit more about the challenges that you said you faced at number 102 in terms of drainage and that it's responsible for a number of other adjacent buildings. Could you just elaborate and say a little bit more about that, please? Thank you. Sure. Um, OK, I'll start with the first question regarding maintenance. So, yeah, that's something that uh, we will definitely we, we've, we whilst we were having the conversations during the consultation period, um, we were very much uh, explaining the works um, precisely so that they any works that we were proposing, they were quite knowledgeable about. Um, this kind of continues, you know, we, we've kept conversations going throughout a lot of the stakeholders are local um, or they're in the building or they're nearby. And uh, so they're very much allowed, you know, they've been allowed. These are sites that are sort of uh, held held back from them. They're very much encouraged to come and see things being opened up. Um, and also we provide them with this information at the end. Um, so there's sort of a, you know, you could call it a care package. We also call it a health and safety file, um, but it keeps that information there for them so that the uh, data sheets, the specifications, the operability of the awnings, uh, manufacturer's details, uh, paint colours, if I've not said that, it's all there. Um, it's all kept there. Um, and of course, we want to keep that um, uh, that uh, um, conversation going, um, you know, and there's also a defects period. So there's this time where we will be able to reassess the buildings, you know, when they settle in. 
and be able to uh, make sure that they can come back and tell us if where things are not as noticeable on the outside, uh, if there's any, been any other further problems. So maintenance, I feel like there's a strategy there in place. Um, regarding your second question about the drainage, um, yes, yeah, so this is a, a historical um, condition where a lot of the drain, th there's this one drainage point into the main sewers from the right hand side of 102. Um, um, and uh, um, and, and um, we had to, we had the conversations from the very beginning with Mr. Patel about the drainage here because there had, you know, the prior to our involvement, there had been lots of floods um, because the pipe, he had already changed the pipe once. Um, so we, <laughs> it had a very small diameter. And so um, again, once we reassessed the volume of water that it was taking from the pitched roof, it was also taking from 106 and 98. Um, they're all feeding in and they're historical arrangements. So it's not an arrangement which we can um, uh, change or alter, but we can improve. Perhaps you would like to say something, Jyoti Padniam, here, no? You're on mute at the moment. Okay. Ah, yes, so actually we are very, very pleased with that, um, the, the drainage uh, problem being solved uh, at least um, after so many years, because we've constantly, every year, uh, uh, we used to have water leak into the shop. And there's an electric uh, and, uh, meter. There's a, there was an electric meter right yes. under the... Um, the outlet drainage. The yeah. drainage outlet there. So we, we, we're actually very, very pleased. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Felicity. You, um, uh, uh, this was really, it, it was really nice to see the, the works that were carried out at our property. And uh, we, we feel very, very privileged that uh, our property was uh, chosen to, to be uh, uh, by the THI to, you know, uh, uh, by the THI uh, initiative, and uh, we are very, very pleased with the outcome. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Yes, thank you. Thank and, you. and one more thing, uh, Felicity, you know, you said that uh, you talked about the care package that has been given to the leaseholder. We're not there. We're not there yet, but it, it will be coming. Uh, when, when, when you, uh, could we, as freeholders, have a copy of it as well, so that Absolutely. we can we can always be on top of them? <laughs> yes. Thank can you. I, can Thank I you. just add? Can I just add a little bit to that? Uh, Felicity's answer on the on the care package uh, uh, over the future is that um, the what the. Uh, the care package or the uh, health and safety package that will be provided is is a carrot and it's you know it's done um you know uh in cooperation with the freeholders and leaseholders but the, the agreement that has been signed the legal agreement that all freeholders and leaseholders sign um does include you know that everyone has undertaken not to undermine the works and mm -hmm. so and there is um there is potential for the council, for for me, for uh, you know, as the project officer, for the for planning enforcement as well, to mm -hmm. to do it, to take take measures if if any of the THI works are undermined. So, okay. um, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that to you too, Giotti no. and uh, Pranam. Yeah. I'm saying that just to let everybody else know to answer Cleo's question, really. Yes. So. That that that's, that's very. Good. Another main uh, the, 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 you saw that. Uh, was called the window was broken once. Uh, yes. Now, the, 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 uh, does we have to take it on insurance? This. Well, he will, how, how does he maintain? The leaseholder has to obviously insure that. Yeah. Insure it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so, for Liz, uh, Eileen, I think you've got your question, your hand up now. Yes, thank you very much. Well, fascinating, amazing. Um, I'm really looking forward to going and seeing, walking by the buildings myself and looking at all the details now. So thanks very much. Um, what I'm, my questions about learning from the experience. Um, 
the Felicity, you are obviously experienced architects in this kind of work, so you already know quite a lot. So I'm I'm particularly interested in what you as a, a, as professionals have learned from this project that you didn't know before or have expanded your knowledge, and whether you could uh, draw out anything that the the owners or the leaseholders of the buildings have learned. Mm -hmm. Just give us examples. Mm -hmm. Yes, on two particular yeah. aspects, I'm one is the buildings, the structures, the, all the material, physical things, any of that learning. The other about Peckham's heritage and about Peckham's history, about the past, anything that you might have learned that would just help to illuminate for us um, what we're doing here, which is main sort of restoring and to, to view the history of this place. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first part of that, um, I think the um, what I learned uh, in Peckham, especially, um, and we were very lucky uh, uh, in one sense with the contractors, they were real specialists in restoration. And they had some really good subcontractors. Uh, we did nominate a few subcontractors, but they also put forward some great subcontractors. And I think something I really, um, uh, I think any architect would say is, you know, really get to know your subcontractors, uh, um, what, uh, and, and embrace their knowledge and experience and expertise. Um, you can really asking the right questions and uh, connecting the right dots. You can really start to um, make the most of the specialisms and make sure you know you're bringing them you sit in that seat and you bring them together um, but it's so great to have that tacit uh, knowledge and that discussion and that openness to negotiate between real reality the real issues on site um, the real dimensions the real um, different differences and tolerances than just sort of maintaining the, the drawing form or the paper form. Um, so I really enjoyed the way the THI evolved, especially on site, to have that relationship, to make sure that um, there was a working, established working method. Um, and uh, so that was something that I definitely take forward into future projects, if it's restoration or not. Um, the uh, second part of your question about Peckham. Um, so that's a really great question. And um, I haven't really, you know, I have so much to say about it. Working on this project for three years, nearly, uh, nearly more, um, I've got to, you know, um, learn a lot about Peckham history. Um, and uh, there is that real grain to it. Um, and that level of information that can be very separated um, and can feel quite disconnected to the present day. But what is quite lovely is just to see the high street um, in its ebbs and flows, seeing how people are doing things to the high street constantly. It's not really this permanent uh, place, it's evolving and changing. And a lot of the times I would come and there were other parts of the street undertaking different things there was you know and I think it's nice to see the history evolve over time so really I was very lucky to be there for such a substantial time to really get to see something change over even just a small period of three four years so um, you know I think that's the nicest way to see history yes to read about it to see the maps see the changes but you can see quite a bit of history in, in real in real life thanks very much uh, I think Benny has a question. Benny? And then Derek. Well done, Felicity. What a fantastic achievement. So exciting to see the pictures. I've kind of noticed some of the bigger moves, but of course being filled in on all the fine details is fascinating. And for all of us, we can, we'll go and look at those beautiful tiles and the metalwork. So impressive. And um, I think Eileen, my principal question was the one that Eileen asked, which you've answered well, which is, you know, how have you changed in those three years? It, you've learned, you've engaged with so many different trades, basically. Um, so my other question was this, um, and it relates to 102 Peckham High Street. Um, and Clyde's earlier question about building regulations. It, at um, number one, at 62 Peckham High Street, we found this old timber frame in there, which is hand hewn. And I think quite possibly a part of an earlier building from the 17th century. It's 
the front was remade in about 1700. Um, so I'm wondering if you found any of that old hand here in timber stuff at 102 Peckham High Street. And the other question was this, um, I've so far I've managed to persuade Kaz the Butcher not to cover these timber walls that have been revealed on the, the flank sides. And, but that's gonna cause a building regulations problem. One of them is a shared wall, but the other one's basically not entirely exposed to the elements, but it's not insulated. I'm wondering, are there ways to get around the strict interpretation of modern building regulations when dealing with these fabulous historic buildings? Yeah, I think uh, that takes again another fine, uh, fine approach with the with whoever's the building inspector, um, as well as sort of seeing which you know which um, parts of the regulations you are looking to exempt the property from. And there's some that are really appropriate as sort of the historical context, uh, you know, DDA compliancy, what back in Victorian time was completely different to now. But as long as you're still providing that accessibility, that um, in a different way or in a temporary way so that you're not reducing the footfall, for example, to a property, to a shop front, um, just to sort of merit a historical arrangement. So there has to be a sort of compromise between what's really going to keep the future vitality of the place and also it, 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 it's, um, its sort of dimensional or um, characteristical traits. Um, in respect of 102, um, we didn't find anything, um, and I'm not just saying that, um, I, I, I have to sort of rack my brain, but we really didn't find, uh, I, I know exactly what you're talking about with respect to the, um, the original nature of the building, but uh, the works that we did were really to that front area, which, as I explained, had really changed due to the, um, the nature of um, the evidence that we saw and I explained so there wasn't there wasn't much there um, actually that we had to do quite a lot to put in a proper projecting shop front uh, roof there um, and the, um, the, the pitch roof area that again was a later remediation to the drainage um, level there so that was that area. Is that, has that helped answer the questions? Yeah, and um, I'll be back to you outside of this call for some of the names of some of those specialist subcontractors. Absolutely. Uh, Derek next, thank you. Derek next. Oh, Nancy, sorry, both, not sure. Yeah, okay. Go. Yeah. Go. There's a question really for Julie, rather. Thank you for the Steve Bay and Lou talk, but uh, I imagine that a full report will have to go to the funders eventually, and uh, that, that's one aspect, this, and this presentation has to be communicated in, uh, in I guess, in written form. Um, yeah. I've taken a particular interest in two properties that are uh, have not yet been dealt with. Uh, number 100, which has a rich, rich history of its own, having been Peckham Theatre in the days of, of uh, wooden theatres and travelling people, and then a Lancastrian school. And I, I, I'm, I guess the one purpose of the project is to encourage other people. Uh, you, you, you've only been able to deal with a, a, a relatively small number of properties in Peckham. There are a vast number of uh, other properties which, which have either not cooperated or could not be dealt with. How might you be able to spread the message, which, which surely must be one of the purposes of having done this at all? 
Yes, thank you, Derek. Um, so a good uh, few questions there. So first of all, in terms of the a report, yes, there is um, uh, a requirement that uh, we, Southwark, put together um, a, an evaluation report that goes to the Heritage Fund. Um, and um, with which so some of the material for that has been collected during the during the project itself but um in fact i was working um on that on that last week kind of trying to think through how we will capture some of the learning and how we will um communicate that you know who, who is the audience for that you know is it is it southern council learning you know what it means to put on a project like this is it um the community you, the community stakeholders um taking forward other initiatives is it the heritage fund um is it um other retailers and leaseholders so i think that um that's something that's very live in my mind at the moment because we're in the last kind of 18 months or so of the project um uh so i think there'll be further communications to um all stakeholders about um, about that shortly um, and then you talked about 100 Peckham High Street and that is um, uh, it is a property that we still hope will become li a live THI property um, we're working um, we and Felicity and I actually met with the freeholders again this morning so we're just working on um, detailed design um, and so we're we're crossing our fingers. It's a very very complicated project um, in in lots, and it's quite different from the ones that we've worked on so far. But we are um, optimistic that it will come forward. Um, so that's that will be a really exciting and a very important um, culmination of the Townscape Heritage Initiative in Peckham. Um, and um, yes, you're right in terms of the THI being an exemplar of what can be done to retail units um, um, in, and uh, other buildings in the town centre. I think there is a challenge because the, these are, this is not a, this is a, this is quite a costly scheme to deliver. So, and the, um, and there is very substantial funding. So I think some thought, uh, you know, maybe we all need to put our heads together to think about what can be issued to other freeholders and leaseholders. And I don't just mean the 44 already that, uh, you know, that were um, made eligible, but that is something to think through. And I hadn't quite um, formed that kind of um, idea on my mind. So I appreciate you suggesting it. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take that away and we'll think that through a bit. Well, there are so many properties in Peckham which have a, a rich history. Sure. The other one I, I was thinking of was in Shard Terrace, where Lord Harris's father opened his first shop. Mm. There, there are countless places. Yeah, which number are you thinking of? Hmm? I, which number is that? Do you remember? Think, I think it's number 100. It's, it's either 100 or 101. OK, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. OK, well, we'll there's there's more thinking to be done about um, the ne you know, next stage is um, post THI. So thank you for your contributions to that thinking. Thank you. Mm. Um, OK, well, look, we're approaching the end here. Um, so I think we should start to wrap things up. Uh, I'd just really like to thank Felicity for a really fascinating and engaging talk and just wish I could rush be in Peckham to look go rush around and look at everything tomorrow. Um, so thank you. Uh, thanks to Julie for um, all her all your work in, on the THI projects and, this, and talking to people and getting people on board. Uh, and um, I think I think that's it for tonight. Unless anyone has got any final comments. Oh, and thank you for the owners of One O Two for coming again. That was really exciting to have another perspective on the the sort of experience of these projects. And hope to hear more from you.
maybe you'd write something for a website or something or just have a kind of ongoing story of your building that would be wonderful I think it's maybe worth saying Claire isn't it that there oh, oh, there there will be a kind of grand finale kind of oh, yes. um, yeah. exhibition kind of um, probably early next year mid June-ish May June next year so we'll we'll certainly be um you know, approaching uh, Jyoti and other freeholders and leaseholders to be involved in that, and obviously everyone else who's at the Zoom to, to, today. So there will be more ta- more opportunities to showcase the THI more widely. And I, yeah, um, and perhaps that feeds into Derek's um, Derek's point about maybe you know widening the learning from you know what mm. can be achieved with retail units. Um, in the town I can see Eileen's got her hand up here. Eileen? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, since there are a number of people that we don't know on this call, that we might just say if anybody's interested in getting more involved in the PHRP in our last 18 months, they'd be very welcome to write to Julie or somebody uh, to get the information. Or maybe you could send an email afterwards, uh, Claire. Well, that's Julie. the plan. That's the plan yeah, to yeah. follow up with an email. Tomorrow. Well, I, I, as a member of a PHRP, I'd like, I'd like to encourage anybody who's really interested in what we're doing to get in touch, mm-hmm. so be part of what we're doing in the last 18 months so that we can think about how we continue the same spirit. Thank you, Aileen. Jyoti, did you want to... Sorry. No, no, thank you very much, everybody. That was really wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really glad we tuned in. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Well, let's have a quick. Should we have a quick round of applause with our, with our hands? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Take care. Best wishes. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.